The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, we'll get started here. Welcome to the Friday Medical Conference. Uh, first off, we'd like to thank our sponsors for a successful 2015 as we look forward to another great year of this conference. Also, at the end of the presentation, if anybody has questions, if you could please raise your hand so we can bring you the microphone so that the people in the remote locations will be able to hear the questions that are being asked. And today we are welcoming Dr. Finn Peterson. Dr. Peterson is a world-renowned hematology expert and program director for the Intermountain Center for Hematological Malignancies, which includes the Intermountain Blood and Marrow Transplant and Acute Leukemia Programs at LDS Hospital. To date, Dr. Peterson has published more than 150 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on topics related to blood and marrow transplantation and high-risk hematological malignancies. He completed his medical degree and fellowship training at the University of Copenhagen and did his fellowship in oncology at the University of Washington affiliated hospitals. So with that, I will welcome Dr. Peterson. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to come to Missoula because I've been here many times and every time I gain new friends. So not only do I come and talk medicine, but I also uh, enjoy uh, interacting with my friends. So the topic uh, of today's conference is the microbiome, the human microbiome, uh, which is an exploding information field uh, in medicine. I don't think you can open a journal within almost any internal medicine uh, specialty uh, without seeing articles on a monthly basis about the microbiome. The number of publications about the importance of the microbiome for a number of diseases is literally exploding. However, before I start on, on the main topic, I do want to just give a small, a slight background um, about my program. Let's get my right equipment here. Um, <clears throat> so I'm the program director uh, of the, an integrated uh, stem cell and acute leukemia and high-risk uh, chemoimmunotherapy program in Salt Lake City. Uh, it's located at the LDS Hospital in Salt Lake City, part of the Intermountain Healthcare uh, organization, which is the major healthcare provider uh, in Utah and parts of uh, Idaho. The program started back in 1978, however, really didn't consolidate until 2006. And in 2007, we opened our integrated acute leukemia program and to date have expanded so that we have nine full-time hematological malignancy physicians and do about 100 uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplants uh, per year, as well as 100 acute leukemia inductions. We also do high-risk uh, myelomas and high-risk lymphomas. And basically, we have sort of a pact with our community oncologist, which is we're not really interested in doing what they are best at doing, but we will do anything that they uh, would rather not do in a community hospital setting, and that is an agreement that works out for all partners and certainly the patients. We have a very large integrated team, including hematopathologists. If we get an acute leukemia Friday afternoon, which is the usual time they come in, um, we will have a diagnosis and be able to start induction therapy and have them stabilized within 24 hours, um, something that we are quite proud of. We have the only comprehensive and dedicated adult acute leukemia program uh, in the Intermountain West, and we see about 70% of all new adult acute leukemia patients in Utah and beyond. So, commercial off. Uh, and after this, I do, have, I do not have any disclosures uh, other than I am the program director. I do like to pluck my program. So now you can ask, why and when did gut flora become of interest to a hematology oncologist like me? Because 
Strictly speaking, you can say this hasn't much to do uh, with hematology nor oncology. But for me, it is sort of coming full circle from when I was a fellow at the Hutchinson Center. And I want to take you way, a long, long time, uh, way back on a time travel, all the way back to the 1950s when bone marrow transplant as a treatment started. Uh, it was very primitive. It was very controversial uh, when Don Thomas did his first transplant back then. And one of the reasons for the controversy was that the tr treatment-related mortality of the bone marrow transplant was excessive. And more than 50% of patients died from bacterial infections. One of the first reports about where those infections came from was published in 1971. And um, you can see that uh, it wasn't very many patients. Uh, it was a heterogeneous uh, assembly of patients with non-malignant and malignant diseases. Uh, very few or too few patients engrafted. 82% of patients developed bacterial or fungal infections, and a majority of those who did so back then died from the infections. But what we did learn was that in every instance of septicemia, identical organisms were isolated from the blood cultures and simultaneously isolated uh, from stool cultures from the patient, uh, leading to our perception that infections in our leukemia and transplant patients are not, quote, catheter related, but they are related to leakage of intestinal uh, organisms penetrating the mechanical barrier and causing bloodstream infections. So it became clear that this had to be a focus of uh, investigation on how to reduce uh, this excessive uh, incidence and mortality. And uh, many both rat and mouse studies had been done. Uh, the Dutch were very active back in the 1970s in figuring out how can we reduce this infectious disease mortality. And one of the pioneers uh, called Van Beckham did some very elegant experiments where he took mice. Some of them were born and raised in a germ-free environment. We call those gnotobiotic mice. Some of them had been uh, born and raised normally, but then mechanically with antibiotic and gabaches decontaminated. And then the, there were mice that were born and raised normally and had been in normal cages. Uh, and those underwent uh, a standard bone marrow transplant. Uh, and what he found was that the germ-free mice, those who had never been introduced to any bacteria and who had no colonization of any kind, had the longest survival. And those who had been born normally but then uh, uh, decontaminated had an intermediate survival. And those who had a normal flora with no attempts to get rid of that flora had the worst survival. And that was put into clinical practice, and it didn't take long for Van Beckham to basically come out uh, in the 1970s and tell anyone who did transplant at that time that patients who received bone marrow graft should be decontaminated and isolated to protect against infection and graft-versus-host disease because already then people had found an association between uh, infections and precipitating uh, often fatal graft-versus-host disease. So the decontamination of isolation uh, of humans in laminar airflow room uh, had been pioneered at the MD Anderson uh, Institute for leukemia patients and in transplant was adopted by Bob Good when he started to transplant children with severe combined immunodeficiencies. Uh, it became quickly uh, a commercial issue. Several companies started to make laminar airflow protection and with the data from Van Beckham, went out and sold them to anyone who did transplant. Uh, and what was found in the initial studies, again by uh, Solberg, who published the first study you looked at, was that those patients who were isolated in laminar airflow and decontaminated 
did not have any exogenous colonization uh, and had no bloodstream infection from any uh, organisms from the outside, whereas patients transplanted in regular rooms were colonized within a week with room residing organisms and with 50% of them uh, developing bloodstream infections. So laminar flow isolation uh, became the standard. And we say that the era of increasingly using decontamination and laminar airflow isolation in uh, human transplants began. When Dr. Beatty and I came to the University of Utah back in 1991, we uh, insisted on uh, laminar airflow rooms being built. And so uh, even up to 1990, uh, using decontamination and laminar airflow isolation uh, became the norm. However, it became clear that, first of all, it did not eliminate the incidence of infection or the mortality from it. And second, it was clear that there were many different and inconsistent decontamination practices from very rigorously trying to sterilize a patient uh, to basically putting some non-absorbable antibiotics in on the patient's uh, uh, desk in the room uh, and not really care whether they took it or not, and usually they would not because it tasted uh, awful. And these decontaminations procedures were rarely done on investigational protocols. They were hardly, if ever, analyzed or published. And it wasn't until in the mid-1980s that a program project grant at the Hutchinson Center in Seattle allowed us to finally do what should have been done which was a controlled, prospective, randomized trial of uh, transplanting patient in laminar airflow uh, isolation and with decontamination and compare it to various others' protective strategies or no strategies at all. And in 1988, we published such a four-armed randomized trials where 342 patients with hematological malignancies underwent a mad sibling donor transplant they were randomized to laminar airflow uh, and decontamination. One, the second arm was the same, but with the addition of broad spectrum prophylactic systemic antibiotics. Third arm was in a conventional room with prophylactic systemic antibiotics. And the fourth room was a conventional room without any prophylaxis whatsoever. There was a significant difference in the incidence of bloodstream infection uh, that was 41% in the conventional room, 25% in LAF, 22% in the prophylactic systemic antibiotic. And so you can see it was similar to the laminar airflow uh, isolation. And the lowest was 10% in the laminar airflow and systemic antibiotic group. That would all be good if it had some tangible benefits for the patients, which it did not because there was absolutely no difference in acute GVHD incidence or severity, treatment-related mortality, overall survival, or days in the hospital. And that may reflect that we had become very good at detecting early bloodstream infections and treating them effectively so that it really had minimal consequences for the patients. Definitely the very expensive and laborious procedure of doing the laminar airflow isolation and uh, decontamination could not be reflected uh, in benefit to the patients. And so at that time, in the 80s, late 80s, uh, the tide changed, uh, and one of the leaders in infectious disease at one of the infectious disease meetings uh, it, it, uh, said that protective environments are discomforting and expensive and do not offer meaningful protection uh, and reiterated what we had shown, which was that uh, no control study has showed that life was prolonged, remission induction increased, no remission duration prolonged. And that was sort of the death uh, stab to laminar airflow. And by the end of the 80s and the beginning of the 90s, the era of decontamination and laminar airflow isolation ended, and the era of prophylactic antibiotics began because that was much simpler. And as you saw, uh, it had the same efficacy as uh, uh, patients who were in the laminar airflow isolation. So that's how things were for the next 10, 20 years. And now, uh, 
the laminar airflow isolation and the concern about the gut flora and its impact on infection sort of uh, faded away until uh, the late 1990s. Uh, when gut flora now was not called gut flora, but became known as microbiota, uh, and ribosome RNA generains started to document that what we thought existed in the gut, which by culture would be a couple of hundreds bacterial species, clearly was erroneous because with the gene arrays, it became clear that there was a surprising quantity of different bacteria in the intestine, many that we had no clue uh, were there, and that the diversity of the genetic material residing in our intestine was amazingly uh, diverse and actually more diverse than the genetic uh, material in our own genome. The concept of the human microbiome was first suggested uh, by Joshua Lederberg, who was a giant in bacterial uh, genetics, and he actually got the Nobel Prize for it in 1958. He coined the term in a uh, contributory speech for another uh, Nobel Prize winner in microbiology in 2001. And microbiome then became defined as the collective genome of the microorganisms that resides in an environmental niche, such as the GI tract, or the microorganisms themselves, respectively. The term microbiota had been in use mainly by ENT and dentists talking about the microbiota in the upper respiratory tract and the oral cavity. And that was defined as the ecological community of all symbiotic and pathogenic microorganisms that occupy an environmental niche, such as the GI tract, or the microorganisms themselves. And you can see that the, by these definition, these terms are basically synonyms, and they are used synonymously, and I will use them synonymously in the remainder of uh, the presentation. Now, the key to all of this was to identify unique bacteria, and we are talking finding uh, and identifying thousands of unique bacteria. So how to do that? Well, in the 1980s and 90s, uh, a technique to do exactly that was developed. It was known that all bacteria, uh, as a matter of fact, that all prokaryotic uh, organisms contain a very specific uh, R, uh, ribosomal RNA that you will not find anywhere else. Uh, it's called 16S uh, uh, RNA. Uh, and it is not a small molecule. It has some protein bases, it, uh, and then you have the genetic material here. And it has 1541 bases and contains unique sequences uh, that will tell you exactly what the organism is, meaning that no organisms had the exact same uh, ribosomal, the 16S ribosomal RNA, and you could distinguish between them by doing whole genome or doing whole sequencing of this RNA, uh, RNA and then classify the organisms according to their differences, sort of like a fingerprint. So, the 16S RNA can identify unique bacterial species. It is as specific as a fingerprint. Uh, it sets the stage for uh, 16S RNA sequence-based microbiome profiling techniques. Uh, and by using high throughput sequencing analysis, it allows, it allows for very fast and very uh, substantive uh, culture independent anal analysis of microbial community composition. And in 2008, the NIH uh, decided that this was important enough uh, to fund and to coordinate, and they sponsored what now is called the Human Microbiome Project, where uh, they allocated resources to enable comprehensive characterization of the human microbiota and its role in human health and disease. 
it was clear when this was initiated that a vast majority of microbial species that already had been elucidated by these techniques had not been analyzed because they don't grow, they don't culture, they will only grow in their very specific microscopic microenvironment in the gut. And if you take them out of that environment and put them into a culture tube, they're not gonna grow. And that's the reason we didn't know about them before these uh, genetic techniques. And the project involved uh, using what had been called a 16S rRNA shotgun metagenomic sequencing, which could uh, identify genetic sequences in thousands of these organisms within a fairly uh, limited time. And the sites where the, uh, the NIH wanted uh, researchers to look for the composition was obviously where the what we consider uh, our normal colonization exists, namely on the skin and its contiguous mu mucous uh, membranes, uh, the upper respiratory tract, the gastrointestinal tract, outer opening of urethra, external genitalia, vagina, external ear canal, eyelids, and conjunctiva, because in all of those places, it was known that there were bacterial communities. So the Human Microbiome Project is studying communities at these different sites uh, on the body. And the technique is sort of the same technique. I don't know if you are aware of how the text of the, of the Dead Sea Scrolls actually were uh, finally composed because those who had the roles would not publish it, but they would publish snippets and then somebody took all of the snippets, found overlapping areas, and were able to put the text together. And the 16S ribosomal RNA shotgun metagenomic sequencing works in the same way. DNA is broken up randomly into numerous small segments, which are sequenced using the chain termination method to obtain reads. Multiple overlapping reads for the target DNA uh, are obtained by performing several rounds of this fragmentation and sequencing. And computer programs then are use, uh, then uses these overlapping ends of different reads to assemble them into a contiguous or con continuous uh, sequence. And that allows uh, to compare it to a ribosome uh, database that the NIH uh, also sponsors called the ribosome, ribosome database project that offers that if researchers with this uh, shotgun genome sequencing uh, have a sequence that they can't identify, they can then send it to this database and it will compare it uh, to what is in the library. And if it is in, then we, they are told what it is. And it, if it is not, it is compared to what is it similar to? Where does it fit in the taxonomic uh, uh, place in, in all these bacteria? Uh, and eventually you end up with phenotypes of these bacteria uh, that if they are matched, uh, then it's a 99% match. Uh, and then if they are novel, they will be entered into uh, the library. And that's how uh, an amazing amount of information about the genetic composition of the bacteria uh, on our body and in our body has been elucidated. And this is what the results would uh, look like. Uh, it turns out that of the thousands, trillions of bacteria in our gut, more than 99% are made up of only two phenotypes, bacteroides and firmicutes. Bacteroides are here, Firmicutes are here, and then you have a whole slew of bacteria that will need to fit in to the less than 1% that they uh, occupy uh, on uh, our skin and in our gut. So we're going to focus on the GI tract. And what we know uh, with all these techniques is that our GI tract contains between 1,000 and 40,000 different bacterial species. These bacteria have 9 million unique bacterial genes that do something, they do something. And in total, there are 100 trillion cells, both genetically as far as the number of genes and in, in regards to the cells, 
that is a factor 10 plus more than there are human cells and different genes in our body. The diversity of, gene of genes and individual organisms is more than 10 times what it is in our organized body cells. The GI microbiome accounts for about 1 to 3% of our total body mass. So if you are a 70 kilo person, uh, you can figure that about uh, one kilo uh, is composed uh, of GI microbiome. And as you can see from all the previous uh, slides, it was this could not and was not recognized until development of metagenomic technologies that only became available in the late 1990s. It is believed, and I would say it is known, that the microbiome in our gut and the health of our microbiome have significant impact uh, on human health. Uh, but we have just started to scratch the surface because a vast majority of microbial uh, species, while we know their genetic sequence have not really been analyzed and thought about as to what they do and what role they play, uh, because there are so many of them and their growth still is dependent upon a specific environment, meaning you only have the genetic information, you do not have the organisms in your hand. So we have a, a substantial organ that's about a kilo in weight. Uh, we know it is composed of a lot of organisms. We know that there's a lot of genes in play and we are starting to understand that this organ does a lot of things, both to maintain our health and uh, playing a role in common diseases we before did not think had anything to do with our gastrointestinal tract. And many calls the human GI microbiome the forgotten organ. It is the largest reservoir of human microbes. Uh, as mentioned, there are more than a thousand different species of bacteria. The microbiome also contains fungi and protozoa, but the volume of that is minuscule compared to the volume uh, of bacteria. And we know that in this GI microbiome or microbiota, there is a widespread commensal and mutualistic relationship, fancy words, commensal meaning that the relationship benefits one and is indeterminate, it doesn't really do anything for the other, and the mutualistic is where it's true, uh, a true mutual beneficial relationship. So those relationships uh, exist and are widespread in our G GI microbiome. Now, how do we get this organ? Because we know that the GI tract in a human fetus is sterile. Well, during birth and within a month, if the birth was vaginal, or within six months, if it was a cesarean section delivery, uh, the neonate or the, the, the infant uh, will establish uh, a microbiota uh, that is very similar to the one that it will have when it grows up and it acquires the bacteria to build their own unique microbiome from already from passing through the birth canal and as well as picking it up from the mom's skin and GI flora. Obviously being passed around in the family, the baby will get the family's microbiota, the diet, the breastfeeding, the environment, both home and outside, including in the pediatrician's office where they can acquire some uh, undesirable uh, organisms that might colonize the GI tract. All of that is what builds the infant's uh, microbiome. We now know, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, that erroneous compositions or development of the infant's microbiome very well may set the stage for later diseases and Two important diseases that has been associated with uh, is type 1 diabetes mellitus as well as schizophrenia. Now, in order for the body to tolerate a, to a kilo of foreign material, of bacteria, uh, there's got to be some benefit to the body. And there are plenty of benefits because the GI microbiota 
provides a wide range of functions that humans lack. First of all, and we knew this from nursing school or medical school, we know that the gut flora prevents growth of pathogenic bacteria, and we now know with the genetics that that is absolutely true. But now we also know uh, that the bacteria will ferment unused energy that we ingest, which lowers the pH, which actually inhibits many pathogenic bacteria uh, and helps to maintain uh, a healthy environment in the intestine. It regulates the integrity and function of the gut mucosa. Uh, many of the bacteria that's part of our normal gut flora uh, can turn carbohydrates that we don't use into short-chain fatty acids, which is key to maintaining a, a healthy gut mucosa. Some of the bacteria produces vitamins that our own body cannot produce, like vitamin K and biotin. And basically, in, within the 9 million genes that exist in our intestine, uh, there is a production of a variety of enzymes, hormones, cytokines, neurotransmitters, many with known metabolic functions that are similar to our own hormone cytokines and neurotransmitters. There are immune and inflammatory and neurological functions going on that we now know are extremely important for us to develop normally, both neurologically uh, and immunological. And many of these uh, enzymes, hormones, cytokines, etc. cetera, uh, we know they are there, but we have not yet determined exactly what their function is. What we do know is that the bacteria from very early on when it colonizes the infant immediately starts to train and promote the early development of the GI tract's mucosal immune system. It's like you have an immune system that's untested in the infant. Uh, it's not good to test it on the really bad bacteria, but it would be excellent if you had sort of a symbiotic relationship with beneficial bacteria who could uh, display some antigens uh, that would train the immune system to rev up an immune response, uh, but it really wasn't necessary because the bacteria are not harmful but it will teach the immune system how to do that when the pathological bacteria inv invades. So the immune system learns to differentiate between harmful and helpful bacteria. It also stimulates lymphoid tissue to produce helpful subsets of lymphocytes by some of the bacteria secreting substances that pathogenic bacteria also secretes that revs up the immune system. But again, this is training. This is not really necessary because these bacteria do no harm. And it also interacts with a number of inflammatory uh, molecules and toll-like receptor molecules and plays a key uh, in repairing mucosal damage. How do we know this? Well, again, go back to the animal model, the gnotobiotic animal model, where animals are born germ-free, kept germ-free, are never exposed to any germs, have no uh, microbiome. And we see that these animals are lacking all of these features of the immune system. Their immune system is deficient. Uh, they have a lot of uh, ailments and and deficiencies, they die early, uh, and if you, after a while in the gnotobiotic stage, let them out of the cage, they will immediately die uh, from invasive infection because the immune system is not capable of dealing with even uh, non-pathogenic bacteria. So are all microbiota the same? Is your microbiota the same as mine? If that's the case, maybe we no longer need to wash hands. Or, uh, but the answer, of course, is no. Uh, our microbiota or microbiomes are not the same. The variability and diversity of microbiomes is massive, both across species, which is no surprise, but also between individuals, and which may be more surprising, it is uh, diverse and variable on the same individual 
uh, depending on a number of factors, such as is it morning, is it night, is it evening? So it changes during the day. And then it changes as part of the evolution over time. It changes over weeks. If you do a whole genome shotgun sequencing of the microbiome and do it a um, week or a month later, you will find some major differences, even though most of it will be the same. But it changes over weeks, months, years, and millennials. But there are some factors that are probably genetic that makes for similarities as, as uh, in, in regards to sort of the mass that is similar and the mass of the bacteria that is different. Here is a study that looked at what, how much of the microbiome is uh, similar and how much is different between unrelated uh, individuals. And not surprisingly, uh, a random, two random individuals will share 20% or less of the microbiome. 80% is unique uh, for their microbiome. When you go to the difference between a, di uh, a dizygotic twin and a monozygotic twin and their mom, uh, you can see that the difference is less, not much less, but it is less. And there is no difference between uh, whether it's a monozygotic or dizygotic twin. The difference between two dizygotic and uh, two monozygotic or dizygotic twin and monozygotic twin is uh, the difference is less yet, yet less, but still uh, with a major part being difference. And when we go to our self, as far as looking at uh, our microbiome, say, over a week, a month, a year, well, not surprisingly, that's who we have most in common with. There is about 80% of the microbiome will stay intact, but 20% of it will be different, even on our own body uh, over time. As a matter of fact, uh, trying to elucidate the importance of the microbiota or microbiome in disease development uh, relies a lot on uh, identical twins, uh, where the twins, one healthy, one with disease X, will have the microbiome genetically elucidated and some uh, major differences that, go, that is repeated in other similar uh, identical twin situation will then lay the foundation for saying that there are certain differences that are associated with certain diseases. There are other factors that makes for variable microbiome differences. Uh, we know that microbiomes have more similarities within ethnic groups, possibly having to do uh, with diets and environment. There's a very nice study showing that the difference or the variability in the microbiome increases with distance from equator. Uh, so environment certainly uh, plays a role, and again, that could be related to diet. And we know that diet itself makes for different microbiome compositions. For example, there certainly is a difference in the microbiome in vegetarians and meat eaters. And we also know that there is a difference in microbiomes uh, between uh, men and women, probably uh, having to do with hormonal and other influences uh, on the composition. So that's a little about the microbiome in health. Let's talk about the microbiome uh, in disease. We know, and we have known this in stem cell transplant for quite a while, as I will show you in a minute, that the balance of the microbiome is critical. We know that if your microbiome is this, that if something happens and the relative numbers between your species either become too high or too low, then uh, harm may happen. And we also know that it is very harmful uh, in losing diversity. It turns out the more diverse the microbiome, the more different species of beneficial bacteria uh, a person has, uh, the healthier the microbiome, and in general, the healthier the person. And if that diversity is lost, then uh, uh, bad things can happen. So what impacts the balance of the micro, uh, microbiome diversity sort of in normal life? 
Well, diet for sure does. Uh, and that has been shown in multiple studies. And what we have suspected has definitely been uh, verified, and that is antibiotics clearly shakes up the balance uh, of the microbiome and can lead to dysfunction uh, and to a dysfunctional uh, microbiome. Those are the two biggies, but there are many other things that will affect the balance and the composition of the microbiome. Chemotherapy and the effect it has on the mucosal membrane will do it. Immunosuppression uh, because of the tight interplay between our normal beneficial microbiome and the immune system will do it. Surgery will do it. Chronic diseases like diabetes and cancer will do it. Other infections will do it, and lifestyle has been shown to uh, alter the composition of the microbiome, both stress, which usually is uh, decreasing the diversity, and exercise, which interestingly enough, increases uh, diversity. So when we go to the gym and we work out and sweat for two hours, and we think that that is what makes us feel good, it could all be because the exercise increases diversity of our microbiome, and it's really not us that are feeling better, it's our microbiome that feels better. So antibiotics is a biggie, because antibiotics is prevalent not only in our setting of being uh, in medical practice, but also in the general population, and this goes worldwide. You certainly know that you can go to many, many countries and buy a variety of antibiotics over the counter, and this is readily being done uh, by people living in those uh, countries. So the microbiome there will constantly be uh, challenged uh, to maintain its, its, its uh, composition uh, if the antibiotic chosen uh, somehow damages some of the good uh, um, bacteria. So the antibiotics can alter the relative number of GI bacteria. It can have a negative impact on all the beneficial functions of the GI microbiome. It can cause diarrhea by irritating the bowel directly or making for a void for otherwise innocuous pathogens to get an upper hand like C. difficile and changing the levels of the gut flora and allowing the pathogenic bacteria to grow. And it can facilitate antibiotic resistance and growth advantage of otherwise controlled um, uh, pathogens. Now, the microbiome composition and uh, being out of balance and having loss of diversity has been st uh, strongly associated with a number of diseases. In my world, it has clearly been associated with the incidence and severity of acute graft versus host disease and transplant-related mortality, but also plays a role, and some believe a, a significant role, in the development of Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, colon cancer, inflammatory bowel disease, leaky gut syndrome, and a variety of liver diseases, including liver cirrhosis. Off-balance GI microbiome may be determine actually the size uh, or precipitate myocardial infarction and strokes brought on in patients with other predispositions. That has been shown now in several uh, studies. And hypertensive patients uh, have been shown to have a less diverse GI microbiome than normal tensive uh, people, uh, resulting in having fewer microbes that make anti-inflammatory and antioxidant compounds and allow, allow inflammation-producing bacteria. And we know this from the identical twin studies where you have an identical twin living in the same environment, uh, pretty much have been exposed to develop uh, a similar microbiome as they can, then one twin develops hypertension and once that happens, you can determine that that twin's microbiome has changed, has lost diversity, and so clearly the composition of our GI microbiome uh, have impact uh, on our cardiac and vascular health. Something that obviously is of great interest, in particular in this country, is the relationship between the GI microbiome and obesity. 
Uh, and we know, again, from twin studies that microbiomes are very different, more different between obese and lean humans. And we know that these differences has to do uh, with having bacteria that has a different energy re reabsorbing potential uh, that because of the mass of them and the amount of energy they consume could lead to an increase in weight um, despite a decrease in food. And there are some old, very nice studies that clearly show that if you have gnotobiotic mice and you give them the microbiome you, you want, you can design a microbiome that makes some of the mice lean with the same diet and some of the mice obese uh, um, uh, with, with the, the same diet for those the mice. And then you can take the microbiome from the obese mice and put it into a gnotobiotic mouse and then that mouse with the same diet will become obese. You can take the lean, the microbiome from the lean mouse and put that into a gnotobiotic mouse, give them the same diet, and they will become lean. And this, of course, uh, has great interest from the industry uh, because if you can design a stool transplant or something to that effect uh, that could make obese people be lean just by changing their microbiome, you have you are set uh, financially uh, for for more than your life. We also know that there is a, a connection between microbiome and cancer. Uh, some bacteria in vitro modulates uh, tumor development and growth, uh, and can they can both uh, stimulate and inhibit uh, tumor genesis. And the GI microbiome manipulations in animal models have resulted in cancer development and in cancer inhibition. And this is a study that has relevance to my field. Uh, it's a study that was done in Memorial Sloan Kettering. Uh, it uh, had 80 patients who underwent an allogeneic stem cell transplant. Those patients had fecal samples that were sequenced for the 16S rRNA on ADMIT and at Grafman. And then according to the findings were uh, classified into three subgroups, high diversity, intermediate diversity, and low diversity. And when looking at the transplant-related mortality, those who had high diversity had the highest overall survival, and those with the lowest diversity had the lowest uh, overall survival. And that was all due to transplant-related mortality, uh, mainly infections and graft-versus-host disease. So we and others are in the process of designing studies of not only taking stem cells from the donor, but taking uh, fecal microbiome material from the donor and transplanting that to the patient as well to see if we can reestablish uh, the diversity uh, after the transplant. A number of other diseases, diabetes, allergies, autoimmune diseases, endocrine diseases, psychiatric diseases have been associated with the well-being of our microbiome. All of this is based on animal models and increasing knowledge about the variety of human-like hormones, immune and inflammatory uh, modulators and neurotransmitters that are produced among the 5 to 10 million genes that are contained in our gut microbiome. And as I said, you can't open a journal without finding one fascinating article after the other that uh, documents this connection and sort of points to a potential way of using manipulations of the gut microbiome to help or to actually fix some of these uh, diseases. And if I was an alien and I wanted to inv invade the earth, uh, I wouldn't come uh, down and look like uh, an alien because everybody would run away scared. No, I would be more sneaky. If I wanted to control all humans on Earth, I came from a foreign planet, what would I do? I would di diverse myself into individual organisms and then I would invade and become the patient's microbiome. They think that I'm a good person, but I have control because in my 9 million genes in the, in the intestine, I can make them do anything. I can produce no transmitter that will put them in a bad mood or in a good mood or do this or do that. That's what I would do. It's a perfect alien invasion, obviously, 
we like to think that that is not what is going on. But it does point to something interest. You may remember Thanksgiving dinners. You talk to your old aunts and grandparents, and they talk about what do they talk about? They talk about their bowel movements and uh, how terrible the fact that they haven't had a bowel movement uh, for two days or three days and what it does to their health and their stomach and your eyes roll. I tell you, they are onto something because there's probably some truth to that. So what lies ahead? Uh, investigation, of course, into how to repair the damaged microbiomes in an attempt to treat a variety of diseases. Uh, and we do that by doing fecal microbiome transplants, uh, MFT from healthy don donors, also called stool transplants, which some find a little crass, but nevertheless, it's, that's what it is. Uh, because fecal microbiome transplants have successfully been performed in transplant patients with chronic C. diff infection that is widely known. We've done 10 of those in our program uh, with about an 80% success rate. And we are embarking, as I said, on an investigation of fecal uh, microbiome transplants in allogeneic transplantation, harvesting stool from the hematopoietic stem cell donor and transplanting it and the stem cells, we are not to forget those, uh, to the recipient. So how are these fecal microbiota stool transplants done? Well, initially it was thought to require doing a thorough colonoscopy all the way to the jejunum and then deposit the transplanted stool material uh, at regular intervals uh, on the way out. Very problematic in a neutropenic patient. As a matter of fact, it shouldn't be done in a neutropenic patient uh, and, and clearly an involved procedure. Then today we now know that we can achieve the same repair by doing upper endoscopies with single deposit of transplanted material post-gastric uh, and just deposit one uh, amount uh, and that appears to accomplish the exact same that these colonoscopies resulted. And obviously what lies ahead and is in investigation uh, is intelligent capsules using special capsule with delayed release of concentrated or selected microbiota um, and probably will be uh, the future. And you can think of probiotics as sort of a, a, a taste of that, so to speak. There are more than 50 published studies of using microbiota transplants in patients with chronic and severe C. diff between 2005 and 2016. The success rate in these patients who have been treated and treated and treated for their C. diff and it returns as soon as you stop the treatment, their success rate on average is 81%, ranging from 46 to 100. Uh, we have done uh, 10 patients and have seen two relapses, so even though it's a small number, that fits what has been published. And there are more than 100 studies, as a matter of fact, uh, approaching 200 studies of microbiome transplants uh, trials listed on clinicaltrials.gov having to do with inflammatory bowel diseases, liver and pancreatic diseases, endocrine diseases, and hematopoietic stem cell transplant looking uh, at potential for reducing treatment-related mortality. So in conclusion, we cannot separate our genes from the genes contained in our GI microbiome. Uh, we have to look at the human microbiome function as one complete organisms, the perfect alien takeover. Human evolution, which we think of as having happened with our gene isolated from anything, is not right. Human evolution had to have evolved as a codependent animal bacterial evolution. Uh, we cannot separate ourselves from what our, how our microbiome and their genes evolved. With nearly 70% of the immune system localized in and adjacent to the digestive tract, a state of controlled physiologic inflammation along with an environmental contact with commensal bacteria is essential for proper development of the immune system. We know that poor or unusual diets, habits, uh, and antibiotic uses are the most common cause of GI microbiome dysfunction in the general population. And we know that that may set at some point, months, years, weeks uh, from initiating that, that that dysfunction can set these people up for developing um, 
uh, uh, a, a number uh, of diseases. Transplanting fecal microbiota from healthy people with well-balanced and diverse microbiomes directly into the intestine of someone suffering from a number of intestinal illnesses has consistently shown great promise for establishing GI microbiome health uh, and balance and potential improvements. As a matter of fact, uh, it seems to be much easier than what you would even dream uh, of if, if you hadn't done it. Uh, and that the list of diseases that somehow is connected uh, with the microbiome uh, is growing. So my last slide, the last conclusion is that you are going to see very soon in your local Costco a whole section uh, of microbiomes that unregulated will be purported to cure everything and anything. And so if your uh, purpose in life after you have cured people and saved life is to be financially secure, then you should buy stock in this. And with that, I will say thank you for your attention. Thank you. In your conclusion number two, you mentioned poor or unusual diet has an effect. How, how, what kind of diet or diets are you referring to? Um, I can't tell you. I mean, it's, um, it, it's known that be, certainly between ethnicities, uh, the microbiome have a lot of similarities that has to do with a particular diet in those uh, ethnicities. We know that in bulimic patients, the microbiome diversity and the microbiome changes significantly to the worse. And I think that you can extrapolate from, from that, that in, to a greater or lesser extent, what we eat will impact uh, our microbiome. Once you make these fecal transfers in these patients, if they continue their own unhealthy lifestyles, diets, over time, do they go back to how they were? Or? Probably. Uh, but that, you know, the fecal transplants for anything but C. difficile, and, and some will even uh, claim that the uh, stool transplant for chronic C. difficile in, infection is still investigational is in its infancy with very little data. It's the concept that's being investigated. We really don't have results. We have from animals, uh, and the data from the animals will suggest that the obese mice that become lean, if you change the microbiome once again, then they will attain you know, whatever feature was associated uh, with that microbiome and diet. But it's, so it's not dissimilar, I think, to uh, when patients develop a, a myocardial infarction, and you can clearly tell the patient that that's because of their unhealthy lifestyle. They then have a choice. They can go back to their unhealthy lifestyle and wait for the next, or they can uh, attain a healthy lifestyle and maybe live longer and healthier. How have you changed your own diet? Pardon? How have you changed your own diet? I haven't, because I feel I'm healthy, <laughs> and I exercise. <laughs> so is there something that we can do to um, help our own um, guts be healthier? Like, is pro are probiotics the answer? Uh, probiotic uh, is not necessarily the answer, but does, have been shown to have benefit in certain uh, gastrointestinal uh, diseases. Uh, again, I think what the purpose of this is, is not to impress upon you to change your lifestyle, but to put up your antenna for what is coming, because it is just about to explode, and it will impact whatever field you are in. And now you are primed to not be taken off guard, which many have. Uh, you do a PubMed search on microbiome, and you will get tens of thousands of hits. Who, know, who would know? Well, the ID folks know, the, the geneticists know. But once it has clinical correlation and once the connection 
mix for an action plan, we need to be ready to deal with that in, in a scientific data-driven way because there will be a lot of noise coming with it. A lot of people, the same people who make uh, dietary supplements are going to be out there and you know trade whatever they trade and tell you things that you need to know whether that's all just fibbing or whether it's actually true. Is that working? Yeah. Um, does it work the other way around? Does the microbiota control us in subtle ways, uh, determining our diet, our behavior to its benefit? Yes, I think you can postulate that to, uh, to some degree. You mentioned that the microbiome may affect um, a propensity for diabetes and schizophrenia. I was wondering if a, a microbiome transplant then could essentially make those diseases contagious. That's the hope. That's the hope. There is, if you put in words like microbiome and the gut-brain axis, you're going to get hundreds of hits that will talk about that. Right. Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Do you happen to have an opinion on how alcohol influences your microbiome? Um, I believe that there are studies that show that it uh, it does and and that it uh, can decrease diversity. So that might be part of the diet one could change. And so when we are told we shouldn't drink alcohol, well, that might be another reason not to do that. Um, I enjoyed your conversation. My husband um, has really gotten into the microbiome, um, all by the belly fat cure book that led him to research Dr. David Perlmutter and William Davis, one's a neurologist and a cardiologist, and just how the microbiome has influ influenced us. And I've been, in, we're in, trying to improve our microbiome with our diet, like with fermented foods and things like that, not taking probiotics, but like kombucha, kimchi. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> no, but I think we have to be very careful not to get ahead of ourselves. I mean, this opened some very, very fascinating doors. There are some animal studies and speculation that this could become very beneficial. We already pretty much know it's beneficial for chronic C. difficile infection, but that's the only one. To extrapolate before we have the data that it will benefit a number of other diseases or that we are able by manipulating the microbiome to influence a lot of other diseases is being ahead of ourselves. It may be true, but the data needs to be there and it, they, it, the data is not there. But it certainly needs to be investigated. Thank you again.